All right, everybody, this is Chris Judge for the Archaeological Society, uh, doing some Archaeology Month uh, interviews. Uh, and uh, it's November, and we still got a few to do. And um, I'm real pleased today to be with uh, Drew Ruddy and Steve Howard. These guys are underwater archaeologists. They've been um, diving in the state's rivers uh, and in the Atlantic Ocean since I was a very young boy. Uh, so they've been at it a real long time. And uh, they've agreed to sit down and tell us about uh, their experiences uh, with underwater archaeology in South Carolina. And I think I'm going to start with Steve Howard. Uh, Steve, I understand when you were about 10 years old, uh, your parents took you to what is now Dorchester State Park and the old fort that was there. And you peered over the wall into the Ashley River. Tell us what you saw. We'd always go on sun, Sunday drives. They'd pack up the station wagon and five or six of us kids and we'd go to one place or another and it was usually historical or some kind of bene beneficial ed educational for the kids. And uh, we went to Fort Dorchester and you know, it wasn't much, it's the same as, as it is now, it's tabby mortar. And we are reading the history and from up on the wall is a 10 year old peered over and there was a barge there with divers and I guess they were running a compressor or generator. There was noise and at the time I didn't know it was six or eight foot deep there, but uh, it was real impressive to know that, you know, you were standing there at a historical fort from the revolution and you're looking down and these guys are going down and finding stuff or figuring out. I didn't know who they were at the time. I guess it was the Navy when they were there in the early 60s. And, uh, but that was, a, I think, one of the starts of the, of my interest in the history of the South Car Carolina. And uh, a couple, three years later, in Boy Scouts, uh, one of the older boys, Tommy Br Browning, he was a member of the diving club, the Amberjacks, and they were diving at Fort Dorchester, and that caught my, I, I've seen divers at Fort Dorchester, and he showed me bottles that he was bringing up at the time. They were some of the first divers there, I think, and I was just in, in, enthralled, so he pretty much introduced me to the scuba side of it, and we first started diving up around the tail race with them and they'd come up with five, 700 pounds left. And I'd get the tank, I'd go down about five, five foot or so and just crawl around the bottom and enjoy it. Uh, probably a year or so later, mom saw that there was a YMCA class for scuba diving. And she says, if you're gonna continue, you will do this. I was, fifth, I was 15 at, at the time. I took the course from Bill Kohler down on George Street and there were 10 people in the class and two of those were Rick Rogers and Drew Ruddy. Drew, I think we all, all kind of swapped home phone numbers, stayed in con contact and that was in the spring of 1967. And I think by that summer, we were at Dorchester, the three of us diving together. And that's fantastic. So Drew, same question for you. Would, how old were you when you first caught the bug? Um, well, um, I took the course with Steve when I was 16. However, um, in the few years leading up to that, um, I was exposed to uh, things. Well, one of my earliest memories of an artifact was going to the old Charleston Museum. And um, I remember there was a dugout canoe. Now at this point, I can't tell you whether it was Native American or plantation era, but I was so impressed. The little placard said that men had dug this out of the bank of either the Ashley or the Cooper River. And it, and it really enthralled me that somebody could go out and find something old like this. Uh, over the next uh, few years uh, prior to my meeting Steve and taking the course, there were television shows such as um, Sea Hunt, 
which introduced us to scuba and uh, the swamp fox that Walt Disney had with Francis Marion. And uh, there was a black and white show in the early 60s telling, uh, I think it was a half hour, telling the story of the Hunley. And so I was all, always gravitated towards the historic end of things. And um, so that, that was uh, what kind of led me to meeting up with Steve in, at the YMCA. All right, now help me out here, guys. Um, Jacques Cousteau and partners invent the aqua lung in the early 1940s. So when you're getting started, is scuba gear kind of new on the scene and just being available to the public? Or were people doing it for a long time in the, in the 60s? Steve, you want that? Yeah, I'll start anyway. Uh, there were no do dive shops. And I think Bill Kohler was the only dive instructor at the time in South Carolina that we knew of. And we got our tanks filled at National Wet Welders. They were up on King Street Extension at the time. And they had a small case off to the side with dive regulators and tanks and I think prob prob probably fins that had US divers gear. And that was the only place to get a tank filled. And that was really the only place in Charleston at the time that I know of that you could buy, a, you know, any dive gear at all. It was, it was very new. And many of the places that we started diving, once we broke away from Dorchester, people were seeing divers for the, for the first time in the local rivers. Okay, so you guys are the pioneers in scuba in South Carolina for, for recreation as well as for historical pursuits then. I think there were probably people doing it about five years ahead of us and uh, getting a good start. But yeah, there were very few and the divers you ever ran into, everybody knew who each other was. Okay. So, all right, Drew, so 1970 comes along and uh, tell me about the Mep Mepkin Abbey shipwreck. Well, I'll be happy to, but let me roll it back about two years if I okay. could. Absolutely. Um, Steve mentioned that we had started at Port Dorchester. We didn't, I don't know that either of us had a driver's license at the time. We probably had beginner's permits. We had to borrow our parents' car. We had no money, you know, to get a tank filled for a dollar was a big deal. I remember my first dive at Dorchester, I didn't have a light, but I took my Boy Scout uh, camping light and wrapped it in a plastic bag and went into the dark water. And I watched the thing flood and die within about 30 seconds. Uh, but we were poor boy in it. Um, but we met up with some um, folks that were interested in the Civil War blockade runners, Georgiana and Mary Bowers, and uh, got invited to go out and uh, participate in their early uh, adventures there. So um, in 1968 and 69, did some um, diving on the uh, forward cargo hold of the Georgiana, and it was loaded with um, not a lot of military armament, armament but um, uh, plates, saucers, uh, sewing equipment, things that I guess were kind of needed in the Confederacy and they were making money on, but not not necessarily war munitions, but that was quite exciting. And then Steve and I got together with another friend, Jim Beatty, and um, made our first dives at Willtown Bluff on the Edisto River in um, 1969. And the reason I wanted to highlight those two sites is, uh, as you probably know, the first underwater antiquities law was passed, I believe in late 1968 or somewhere thereabouts. So the Georgiana project was absolutely state license number one. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve and I, uh, well, uh, Jim Beatty and I actually applied for a license with Dr. Stevenson. He just came aboard, I think, right around late 68 or 69, right around this time. And we applied for uh, a permit to dive at Willtown Bluff on the Edisto, which was, you know, a colonial site uh, first settled in the, um, 1680s or so by dissenters coming over. And um, it was along, well, actually it preceded Dorchester by a few years. 
And uh, so uh, I was really surprised that, well, I'm surprised today that they gave us a permit. But at any rate, we tried to keep uh, some, the best we could uh, records and uh, shared artifacts with the state. That's where I met Stanley South because he had come to South Carolina around that time to work at Charlestown Landing Big. And um, so at any rate, uh, I wanted to let you know that we were involved with um, two of the uh, early actual official licenses. But now the Mepkin Abbey vessel, which was in 1970, was kind of a test case. What was gonna happen if you died to site and you didn't have a license? Um, I, I don't wanna prolong this discussion, but basically a friend of ours, Bob Densler, was teaching a fellow to dive in the Cooper River. The guy had never been underwater before. He, they were on the bottom, drifting along the bottom near Mepkin and Bob found an anchor rope trailing across the bottom and somebody had lost an anchor. So he followed the rope to see if he could recover the anchor and it went into the frames of a shipwreck. And um, about that time, the other fellow panicked, kicked Bob's mask off and Bob got him to the surface, got him back in the boat, but he said, no more diving today. So he called me that, uh, that evening and we went back a few days later and went down and we recovered it was a beautiful, about 50 foot sailing vessel, probably sank 1830s or 40s or so. And we, that day we recovered nine stoneware jugs. However, we didn't have a permit, uh, you know, an official salvage permit. So it was kind of a test case. I immediately wrote a letter to Dr. Stevenson reporting it. And I knew, although there weren't very many divers at the time, I knew that there were divers starting to creep out and dive sites without state involvement. So I figured, well, this is going to happen if we establish a rapport with Dr. Stevenson and figure out how this is going to go diving on some sites that you might find accidentally or that you might go to and find some things before, uh, you know, official salvage licenses there. And uh, interestingly enough, Dr. Stevenson was very, very supportive uh, to him having that open dialogue and some informal reporting um, was, um, I think he was pretty pleased with that. And so that a few years later, it evolved into the hobby permit program, but, uh, that, that was the Mepkin Abbey vessel was, uh, one of the, I think, test cases of how the state and the divers were going to interact. So very, so very, Dr. Stevenson has just arrived in 1968, the first state archaeologist, or the second state archaeologist. Uh, to start the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology, and you guys are immediately interacting with the professional community. And I guess, uh, very fortunately, Dr. Stevenson was very open to this uh, dialogue, you know. And, and I know, Steve, uh, you worked early on with Alan Albright and Ralph Wil Wilbanks at the Institute of Archaeology? Yeah. Uh, Ralph, well, Drew went in into the Navy, and... Uh, our other buddy Rick went into the army. He was an ar army diver. And so that left me without diving partners. And uh, so Ra Ralph and I started diving together and in the rivers and the caves and, and, and all. And I started diving at the, at well, working at the wet shop and running their charter boat mostly out, out, out to the reefs. And Ralph was an uh, instructor then, or becoming an instructor. And so with he and I di diving together, uh, we pretty much uh, start, he started, uh, well, in my spare time, while I wasn't at, at the shop, uh, Wade Quattlebaum was diving in, in the Cooper at that time. And uh, Ralph wasn't doing much, but teaching di diving. So we both started diving with, with, with Wade. And shortly after that, I think Alan came on board and then Ralph was hired as the first assistant uh, underwater archeologist. And because of our close association, I was involved in uh, some of the earlier projects that Skia had, uh, the Bluff Plantation at, on the Cumbahee uh, at the Wadbu Creek and the Cooper, and uh, a few, a few of the others. Now, Steve, Drew sent me a picture of you, and you can't be more than about 
eight or nine years old, and you are at the ship's wheel of a large, what appears to be a large vessel. You seem to have been born a mariner. Uh, my father was a, a lifer in the Navy. He put in 30 years. He retired when I was 12. Uh, and being it in the na Navy, didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the sons gro growing up, being ship shipped out and moving up all the time. So he bought a shrimp boat. And my older brother and I, Tony was two years older than I, and we started, so I was 12. He was 14 or 15 at the time. I was too small to do anything else but steer the boat. <laughs> and dad would say, follow, follow Dan Magwood on the Burt Mar. He said, follow him anywhere. So I just kind of steer behind. And by doing that, I learned how to, uh, you know, where to go and where not to go. And at the time I didn't realize it, but we were uh, dodging ironclads, the, you know, the Weehawken and uh, the ones that l are laying off Folly Beach. But so, yeah, I, I came into it and I, I took to it. That's, I've always worked either on or under the water since, since then. Gotcha. So Drew, you went in the Navy, were you a frogman? Well, I don't know that they call it, I was not a frogman per se, but I was, um, I started out as a, a second class Navy diver, which would have included um, scuba and uh, the old Mark V um, brass, uh, bronze, uh, copper, copper helmet. And, um, and then I had the opportunity to get more education. I ended up being trained as a saturation diver and I served on a couple different ships, the USS Puget Sound, which was a destroyer tender, and the USS Ordalon, which was a submarine rescue ship. Outstanding. Now, both of you were involved in the discovery of the Hunley and its recovery? Steve? Yeah, and the recovery. Well, with my close association with Ralph through the years, uh, when Clive Cussler first started coming down looking for the Hunley in, I think it was 82 or so, Ralph was still working for the state. And so Ralph was the skiers representative to go on the projects and search. And it would always be, you know, uh, the cast of thousands of, you know, he'd bring down 20 people or a dozen and they'd go out in different boats and, you know, the search would last about a month or so. And over the years, I mean, he'd, 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 he'd look for a month or two, then he'd end it. He'd come back either the following year or the year after that. And over time, it kind of dwindled out. And he had Ralph Wilbanks and Wes Hall saw that they were doing the lion's share of the work. So thought if, they could go out when the weather was good, instead of having an expedition, they just go out, look for it and keep, and keep track. And at the same time, me working on boats, I was available to go out. I wasn't there the day they found the Hindley, but I was there a bunch of days we didn't. And there was a lot of hard work in, in uh, driving those straight lines with the, the side scanning sonar and looking for anomalies that finally paid off them. Yeah, and they had actually come across the wreck years er earlier, but some whoever went went down came back up and said, that's not, not it. So they continued on to look for other things and it finally became, they were expanding the search area by so much. They said, no, let's go back to where we think it is and find out what each individual wreck is. We're gonna identify it and instead of saying it's not that. So a very, very systematic search. All right, well, let's see. Um, let's turn to the old Santee Canal project, Drew. Tell us about that project. Well, um, as you, probably know and probably the viewers know, uh, one of the first 
canals in the uh, United States was the Santee Canal. Uh, there were some that went around some falls, some short little legs, probably further north. But um, in 1793, I think under the governorship of uh, William Moultrie, uh, the Santee Canal was begun. Now this was a summit canal, it was the first summit canal, which meant that from the sand, they wanted to connect the Santee River with the Cooper River to cut many, many miles uh, out of the trip to uh, get things from upstate to Charleston. Um, they had to go uphill about 35 feet, cover a straight stretch about five miles, and then step back downhill about 65 feet to link the Cooper River or the Santee River with the Cooper River. Three of the, there were a total of 11 locks, um, two of them double locks um, in, in, the, in the 22 mile run. And um, uh, three of the locks are over in the Pineville, South Carolina area and exist in varying states of uh, preservation. When they built the Lake Moultrie in the 1930s and so forth and flooded it probably around 1940, six of the 11 locks were inundated under Lake Moultrie. One of them was, not lock number 10, was totally destroyed and taken out when they built the dam. And then the tide lock, which is um, basically uh, in Santee Cooper property over around the old Santee Canal Park, uh, it's, it still kind of exists, but you can't see anything above the water. Uh, over the past, uh, oh, three or four years or so, uh, since we have um, inadvertently evolved into a, uh, inadvertently, meaning that Steve and I didn't know anything about uh, digital technology, but we stumbled into uh, knowledge of GPS and side scans. Well, I can't say that. Steve worked a lot with side scan, but I didn't know anything about it. And uh, anyway, um, uh, with Google Earth and overlaying maps and whatnot, we have now been able to find the six locks that are under Lake Moultrie. And um, we have a good friend, Billy Judd, and uh, R Dr. Richard Porche, who uh, are doing a lot of research on the history and the mechanical aspects of the locks and so forth. And we have been able to do some uh, diving to take measurements, look at the similarities or the dissimilarities of one lock from the other and um, you know, get a lot of information on, uh, on the construction and the current state of uh, wellness of each lock. Some are, a couple of them are in pretty rough shape. Some of them are in pristine shape. That's a great project. I've seen yeah. good papers at the annual conference on South Carolina archeology span on that project and uh, fantastic stuff. Um, before we move to the uh, artifact document, documentation project you all been working on, I'd like to ask each of you the same question and what is the most interesting thing you ever found diving in South Carolina? We'll start with Steve. Single most interesting thing you found. Doesn't even have to be archeological. Uh, I think probably when we were working on the Georgiana and the Mary Bowers back in the early 70s, uh, we went out and uh, I drew, drew can think, I can't think of the, the blockade runner that's just offshore of that. The we Constance. Was that? The Constance. Yeah, the Constance. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, we were diving on that. There wasn't that much to it. And we were using the prop wash and blowing down around the hull. And I came up with a bosun's whistle. Yeah, uh, wasn't, you know, it, and being that it was buried, it was like the day it went down. Knowing that it was a unique art artifact came up maybe a hundred foot from the boat, put it to my, took the regulator out, put it to my lips and went. <whistles> and I just think, you know, it, what, you know, it doesn't have a lot of value. It's not real exotic, 
but that to me gave a personal note of, uh, anyway. So you got to reach out and touch the past. And I was yeah. going to ask you if you blew that whistle, so I'm glad you did. <laughs> First thing when I got to the surface. <laughs> That's excellent. That's fantastic. All right, Drew, how about you? Well, if I could, I'd like to give you a little anecdote about a just a very surrealistic moment in my diving. Not so much about a specific artifact, but I'll start by saying that uh, as a young uh, sailor in the Navy in the early 70s, uh, I was out in San Diego and I was volunteering and putting in for second class Navy dive school. And one of the uh, prerequisites was that you had to go to a command that had a hyperbaric chamber and you had to do what they call a pressure and oxygen tolerance test. They put you down 60 feet under pressure and then you breathe oxygen for 30 minutes. That was part of the, see if you were physically up, uh, okay with that. And I happened to be um, sent to uh, a, a ship called the USS Dixon. And it was uh, probably, it was a submarine tender out in San Diego, it was a little over 600 feet long, and I think it had a crew complement of just over 1,300 men. So it was a, it was a big ship. I did my pressure all, uh, oxygen uh, tolerance test and went on to uh, dive in the Navy as well as in the offshore oil industry. When I worked uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, I worked for Oceaneering International which was a company that ultimately got involved with the engineering and rigging and so forth for the Hunley project. And uh, due to uh, involvement in South Carolina diving, as well as having some experience with oceaneering, I was invited to join the Hunley project. On my first dive on the Hunley, it, I got a, a board for the, sort of the last phase uh, when they were getting ready to raise the Hunley. The job had been shut down for some weeks because of getting a, a barge in and uh, the top of the sub had been excavated but they had been they had sandbagged the the entire uh top of the hunley uh while while the way waiting on the lift barge to come in and so forth so on my first dive on the hunley i was sent down there and there was another diver and we were dredging and my dredge de developed problems so they told me to start unpacking un unbagging the the, the sub so it was uh, removing sandbags, and I went from the bow to the forward conning tower hatch. And then they told me, well, the other diver has to, uh, the dive was soon to end. The other diver was gonna have to send up equipment. They didn't have anything for me to do, so just kind of hang loose um, you know, on the Hunley and get familiar with it. Well, Chris, it was very surrealistic because I knew that I was at that conning tower of the Hunley, a story that Steve and I had heard for decades and right inside inches bet uh, between um, myself and um, and the crew inside were the human remains of George E. Dixon, young 20 something year old man who was the captain of the Hunley, who that 600 ship foot ship uh, in San Diego was named after. And it was uh, uh, quite a, uh, an honor to be able to continue to participate in the recovery. Not only that, but I knew that my really great friend, Steve Howard was out on the job and Ralph Wilbanks was out on the job and we were working together to salvage uh, just a uh, archetypal uh, uh, part of underwater history. And uh, to know that we could bring young George Dixon and his crew back in and uh, got to ride the barge back into Charleston with them. And, um, uh, you know, I found some artifacts, but hardly anything compares to the, exper the experience of, of being able to touch history to that degree. That is a phenomenal story. <laughs> that is fantastic. Gosh, oh man. So tell me about the, uh, well, first of all, it seems to me like you guys have been involved in all the important underwater archaeology in the state over, I think, is it six decades now? I mean, it's a long time, uh, between five and six decades. Uh, it seems like, you know, you've been uh, called upon for your expertise, um, realized at a very young age, as teenagers, that the recording and the documentation of this is as important, as, if not more important, than the uh, artifacts themselves 
And this has sort of culminated in a kind of a unique project. And uh, correct me if I don't get this title right, the South Carolina Artifact Documentation Project? That's correct, yeah. Tell, tell us about this project, because I think this is something that uh, uh, it's all encompassing of, a, of many decades of work by many people and will be a unbelievable t tool here in the present and going forward. Um, Steve, can I lead into this and let you take it after? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's your... I, I, um, in the 90s, I started to do a little volunteer work with Skia out on James Island and um, uh, Lynn Harris and Carl Naylor were operating that office. And um, I, through uh, dialoguing with them, I found out that in the early 80s, Ralph Wilbank had started to go around and photograph artifacts in hobby divers collections. And so I said, well, let me try to take Ralph's work and put it into some kind of us usable form since we're now entering the digital age um, and uh, sort of gather some of that information. And then Steve and I kind of informally talked and said, you know, we know about so many artifacts and so many divers and so many friends that um, no, their stuff's not documented. So we decided to go ahead and start uh, on our own, uh, starting with our own collections and then venturing to friends and then getting referred to other people, going in and photographing collections. And of course, uh, we told folks, you know, as, uh, whenever we got started on this, that everything that they uh, um, shared with us, we were planning to share with the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology because you know, we wanted the professionals to have this documentation. So, you know, tell us anything you want. And if there's something you don't want us to know, don't tell us. But, you know, everybody agreed. And I mean, it was amazing how cooperative and friendly and enthusiastic most of the people we went to uh, were and still are. I mean, we still occasionally go out and do a collection. Um, and Chris, you would not believe the beautiful artifacts, Native American fossils and historic period artifacts that we've been able to photograph. Now, I don't claim to be a very versed uh, uh, photographer, but um, we, to me, uh, just getting the information is the the most important part of it. Um, Steve, I'll hand it off to you and let you comment on that. All right, Roy. Well, it was mostly Drew's idea and his pushing uh, when we did get start, started, uh, like you said, we were doing Ralph's collection. I was a little bit more computer savvy than Drew was at, at the time, but he's far surpassed me now. Uh, but because we started diving at such an er early age, uh, we were some of the first there, but by the early 70s, there were a good many people diving, and most of them were uh, 10 years older than we were. And our good friend, Bob Densler, who actually found the Mepkin wreck, he was our mentor. He was old enough to own a boat and uh, take us to the rivers. But he passed away and we saw his collection go by the wayside and split up among his kids and all for naught. And he was, you know, the pioneer. He was one of the earliest divers. And so uh, during the 90s, we were seeing more and more of these older divers uh, pass. And before they did, we wanted to get their collections because they were important and they were some of the first. And as Drew said, just some incredible artifacts uh, everything from historical and prehistoric, just, you know, we've had a good time do, doing it. And like you said, almost without exception, every diver has been more than happy to share what they found with us and uh, to go on. And we're trying to put it together on the internet and with South Carolina Digital Lot Library and to record and preserve it. 
like I said, this is an incredibly admirable project. I remember, I believe Carl Steen uh, called my attention to what you all were doing. And um, Drew, you say your photography is not very good. I, I've seen some of your work and you do very good photography. And you were uh, very generous to share with me uh, a couple of my research interests. One is on prehistoric Native American pottery. And you shared some incredible pieces with me that uh, you had documented. And then I was doing a project on stone gorgets and uh, sent you an email. And pretty soon I've got, uh, I've doubled the number of gorgets that I know in South Carolina uh, from that project. So uh, I see this as a very kind of a companion to the work that Tommy Charles did with uh, terrestrial based collections. And I think the success of it has a lot to do with the fact that you guys don't work for the state. You're not professional archaeologists who people are kind of uh, maybe kind of concerned about letting into their house and showing what they've got. And uh, so you're going around and you're interviewing your peers. You know all of these people. And uh, I think for a long time to come, this will be a database that archaeologists now in the future will continue to go to. And uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic contribution to knowledge. One of the um, recent experiences that I've had that uh, sort of um, bears out um, where we are happy to see some of this go is um, I have been for the last few years on the board of directors of the Berkeley Museum in, in Monk's Corner. And uh, in 2009, prior to my involvement with the museum, Steve and I were invited to photograph the collection uh, of a diver really nice guy, Robert Lewis Jr. And we called him Bubba. And um, I shared this information with Skia. And uh, next thing I know, Al Goodyear was real excited about some of his Native American points. And um, uh, sadly, um, a couple months ago, um, Bubba passed away. But he left uh, his wishes to his wife saying, I don't want my collection to be broken up. Uh, please keep it together. And she contacted Berkeley Museum and uh, we have worked to uh, bring that collection into the museum and display many of the beautiful pieces. Um, so that's a, an example of a diver appreciating the value of having his legacy be left uh, for public uh, enjoyment and, and education. And um, he had some pretty significant um, Native American historic and fossil materials that uh, hopefully will be enjoyed for generations to come. That's a great story, great success story. Well, before we I ask you for closing remarks, um, ask each of you, and I'll start with Steve, uh, what advice would you give to a young person getting involved in uh, underwater archaeology today? Finding old stuff isn't archaeology. It's in the documentation and the recording of it. And it's great because at this time and place with what we have, I mean, our phone can do everything that we used to pack up a van with and do. I mean, you have positioning, you have the photography, and I think... I think that recording is so much better. But in that same thing, it's not finding the old stuff, but it's working with people like yourself and the professionals and for them to learn the techniques and the terms uh, of the trade so it can be shared with the citizens of South Carolina. All right, same question for you, Drew. Well, uh, I can't say enough uh, how important it is to, uh, to document, whether it be the professionals doing it, people like us, or each individual collector um, uh, being able to keep a record of what and where, uh, what the details are. Can I just uh, ramble for a half a minute here on a recent project that I think is a great example of professionals uh, and um, avocationals working together. And that's the Lewis Field um, vessel. 
Um, in Monk's Corner here, and uh, we've recently been more and more interested uh, in the revolution because we had so much activity, the American Revolution. And um, you're probably aware of the uh, approximately 50 foot long sailing vessel that was sunk in front of Louisville Plantation, July 16th, 1781. We know the exact uh, circumstances of its sinking. In 1985, uh, three uh, avocational divers, uh, sport divers, uh, Bobby Snowden, Don Ard, and uh, uh, Steve Thornhill came across this uh, wreck, which was um, virtually totally buried, and they found two cannons, a uh, swivel gun and a three-pounder uh, cannon. Uh, Skia came under the direction, well, Alan Albright was the underwater archaeologist, but the main on-site um, uh, archaeologist was Carl Steen, who was fairly new working for Skia, fairly new in his career, I think, at the time. Um, I don't mean to make this a long story, but in the past few years, we found out that Carl had done a tremendous amount of research that never got published. We also found that uh, one of the cannons, there was a third cannon found about a year later, one of the cannons was deteriorating. And so the museum was involved in getting a grant to send it to the Hunley lab to have it taken care of and it's beautiful. The divers who originally found it still had a share in the artifacts. That's the way the license of the original agreement was written, but they relinquished their share of the ownership of these artifacts um, on a little deal that would allow these uh, guns to remain in Berkeley County for, for decades to come. And um, so with, I can't say enough about Carl Steen, uh, going back and at, at my request, um, revisiting his original work, Carl Naylor, who was on the project, uh, did editing and um, Steve and I did a lot of work on um, uh, getting pictures in and whatnot. And we presented uh, to Dr. Steve Smith and Dr. Jonathan Leader, a finished report a couple years ago on this and the Berkeley Museum, hopefully in the very near future, we'll have all of these artifacts on display. And I think that's a real success story with, uh, you know, the, the avocational, the professional, the museum, uh, you know, and, and the Hunley Lab, the conservators, all, all pulling off uh, something that's going to be around for many of our descendants to enjoy. The, the beauty of collaboration, uh, multiple partners. That's right. Gosh, this has been great. Y'all, any, any final comments, any additional stories you'd like to share with our viewers? Uh, that's, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, that's a dangerous thing to ask because <laughs> Steve and I got a million C stories. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> I was just gonna say that we were fortunate to come into this when we did and to have Dr. Stevenson was a, big influence in how we proceeded and how we continued through throughout the years that uh, Drew and I were fortunate enough to be at the first meeting of the South Carolina H Historical Society and we go into the auditorium up in Col Columbia we drive from Char Charleston a couple of te te teenagers but I think that's what was impressive is Dr. Stevenson was in the first row and there were other professional archeologists, but there, you know, the, everybody was pretty much amateurs. They were people that were interested in it, you know, the members of the society. And I think that from the very first influenced how we've uh, in, it interacted with the professional community ever since. Well, that's fantastic. Um, well, listen, we may have to we may have to do another round of this at some point because I do sense, and Drew, you've alluded to it that I may have only scratched the surface of the great stories that you all have to tell. But uh, it's been a pleasure listening to you both share your information. Uh, charter members of the Archaeological Society of South Carolina in the initial year of '68 joined the Archaeological Society and. Uh, uh, have blurred the lines between professional and avocational. I think, uh, I think, I think you guys are closer to our side than the other side, and uh, 
been a great pleasure talking to you and uh, I hope we can do this again soon. And, and Drew and, and Steve, I hope we can get uh, Billy Judd when he's up to it to talk about his aspect of the work that you all have been doing. So thanks a million. I really appreciate you talking to me today. All right. Thank you. Thank you and we appreciate the work that you're doing. Thanks a lot, guys.